set up uh, from, from the beginning. Okay. And what I do is I switch. No, not that. Okay. Nope, swap. Okay. All right. I have two monitors set up. So one I can read from and then one I have everybody on the videos. So if I'm looking towards something else, it's because I'm looking toward another monitor. So we are gonna discuss uh, Chancellorsville and in respect to the Pyrrhic victory. Now the purpose is to look at the strategic disadvantages at, that resulted from the Battle of Chancellorsville and look at history through uh, a military studies uh, perspective. That's the art of war and strategic vision. That's foresight. And in order to have foresight, a leader needs to know how to do hindsight. So we are gonna be talking a little bit about hindsight. So what is a Pyrrhic victory? That is a victory uh, results in such a heavy toll, it negates any true sense of achievement or damages long-term progress. Or you can also say a Pyrrhic victory is a victory in which a commander loses more than he gains. All right, historic context. Where do we get the term Pyrrhic victory? Well, there was a King Pyrrhus. Yes, he was Greek. He was one of the kings of the most powerful Greek tribes between 306 and 272 BC. And one of his famous quotes is saying, uh, one more such victory and we are undone. All right, historic example. And yes, I do like the Revolutionary War. I read several books on the revolution while I was writing my book on Lee. Uh, it was very, um, it was very good to, to, to do, uh, just comparing and contrasting. But after the Battle of Bunker Hill on June 17, 1775, one British general sarcastically suggested Americans' plan ought to be to lose a battle every week till the British army was reduced to nothing. And the same British uh, general cautioned, it may be discovered that our troops are not invincible. They certainly are not immortal. Uh, very prophetic. Okay, now fast forwarding, we're going to just do a quick overview of, of the Battle of Chancellorsville. Again, we're not going to get into the weeds of Chancellorsville, um, of who turned, which regiment turned right, and etc. Um, we're going to look at the overview first. Uh, strategic objectives. Now, when you say strategic, that means large scale, long term goals. Technically, what Lee has as his strategic objectives are, are actually grand tactics objectives. That means a smaller scale. However, that that's a different topic, and we can discuss that um, in a, another lecture at some, some point. But uh, so Lee's strategic objectives, I'm doing quotes here, that's uh, he's going to make a decisive victory that ends the war by incapacitating the Army of the Potomac to the point it cannot recover from defeat. To protect Richmond capital of the Confederacy, and three, liberate Fredericksburg. So that's his big, big goals. All right, tactical, least tactical objectives. So he wants to capture the crossroads at Chancellor's Manor. And if you see here, I, I did a nice arrow, bright arrow, red. Uh, that arrow points at uh, and my cursor's going around the Chancellor's crossroads. Lee wants to capture that. Uh, his second tactical objective is to kill or wound as many Union soldiers as possible. And he's going to try to do this by flanking the U.S. right flank 
in conjunction with hitting the US left flank. So he's gonna do a one-two punch, slam, slam him, slam the Union Army in between the, his the Confederate two flanks. Uh, the battle lasts from May 2nd to May 3rd. Okay, what's the consequences? Well, we've got temporary advantages here. For the moment, the victory protected Richmond and liberated Fredericksburg. Okay, this buys Lee some time. And it boosts morale for the Army of Northern Virginia soldiers and Confederacy. That, that's a, that, those are all positive. So let's take a look at what happens with consequences, strategic disadvantages. These are these are, are going to be problems that he's going to have to deal with. One of the biggest problems he's going to have is the morale boot that bo is boosted turns to overconfidence, arrogance. And this includes Lee. And I found a great quote that he wrote to uh, Major General Hood after the Battle of Chancellorsville. Lee writes, if the army would be invincible if he, if it could be properly organized and officered. So Lee believes if he can organize it and have it have the proper leadership, the army, his army would be invincible. Okay, so this arrogance is also uh, contagious and runs through the soldiers and officers of, of the Army of Northern Virginia. And this is definitely going to influence the next campaign. It's a balance. You, you want to be confident. Every combat veteran I've ever talked to was confident. But when you get arrogant, when you get cocky, that's where the problem comes in because that's where emotions take over and you don't think properly. So your third problem here is Lee overlooked the fact that his army was not indestructible and replacing casualties was getting more and more difficult. It's, it's one of those things that Lee, Lee wants that decisive victory, but his men are dying in, in mass. And we're gonna see what's going on with the casualty problems. So here's your Pyrrhic victory. He's got out of 61,612 soldiers and, and all these numbers are rough, uh, rough. Soldier, uh, the soldiers generally took into battle. So he's got the 61,612 soldiers he took into battle. His crusade cost his army 13,500 men killed, wounded, or captured. That, that's, that's just way too many. And, and you look at the breakdown, you've got killed 1,649. Now, okay, we all say in our heads, well, that's not a big number. In 1863 terms, that's an entire brigade. Dead, gone, can't get it back. Now you've got 9,106 9, wounded. Many of those wounded are not coming back. Many of them, I, there's no way to figure out the percentage, are, are mortally wounded. Um, that's equivalent to an 1863 division. Then you have another 1,708 missing, probably prisoners, others, at least with Chancellorsville, just like Wilderness, they, um, the, the, their bodies are never found in, in and the, the shrubbery and brush and, and uh, you know, the mess that was in, in Chancellorsville. So it, it's not good. Now we break it down even more. And I, what I did was I broke this down in order of more difficult to replace. And this is what a strategic leader has to do. All right, how many men am I losing? How can I get them that experience? And when, when we talk about numbers, I want you to put in there experience. 
It's your experience that your leader needs. I, I can guarantee you a senior commander would rather have a team of experienced special forces, 12 to 24 guys over, you know, 100 guys who are just right out of boot camp. That's the experience on the battlefield is it's you, you can't uh, it's, it's hard to explain, but it, it's in, incredibly important. So you've got killed with your combat veterans at the privates, corporals, and your non-commissioned officers, which are corporals and your sergeants. You've got 1,546 killed. Then you've got another wounded. You've got 8,591 wounded. And then you have 1,600 uh, 636 missing. So those are your guys that are on the are on the front lines. They're pulling the trigger. They're fixing bayonets and taking your tactical objectives. Uh, you you have to have experienced veterans who have been there in battle and can weather the storm mentally and physically. Uh, you're uh, out of the uh, officers uh, cadre. You've got 103 officers killed, 515 wounded, and 72 captured or missing. And then you have regimental commanders, 40 experienced regimental commanders killed or wounded. Uh, let's put that into uh, perspective. Uh, on average, you've got 20 regiments um, made up a division. So you've got two divisions worth that needed to find, Lee's got to find regimental commanders. Uh, that's a lot. And then you, you look at this in uh, late 1863, it was reported that there was over 3,000 Confederate officers imprisoned on Johnson Island. Now, if we break that down, a typical regiment, um, at its highest would have been a thousand men in 1863. That's much lower, but still. So you've got your regiment with a thousand men and 41 officers, and that's counting your chaplain and other staff. So if you divide the 3,000 plus officers who were captured and imprisoned at Johnson Island, um, and you buy 40 officers, you get 75 regiments. So Again, roughly that 75,000 man army that those 3,000 officers could have helped. Hi, Kitty. So that is um, a lot. Now, what are these sergeants and, and, and lieutenants doing that's so important? Well, here's, here's your um, significance of the combat veteran and the regimental officers and your non-commissioned officers. He's, these are the guys that Lee's losing. You've got your colonel at the head. Let's see, right here. Your major is over here. That's your left flank. I, 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 I for some reason, have problems with right and left. That's why I didn't go in the military. At any rate, um, your sergeant major, very significant position, is back here. Then all these guys, that's all individuals, you've got your sergeant, a lieutenant, a sergeant, 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 file closers. These guys make sure the privates go the right direction. And if they start retreating, they tell them to get back in line. They either hold them in line physically. Uh, occasionally, you have uh, read of situations where the, the sergeants or lieutenants shot the uh, privates for, for deserting. Um, so that is where you have your significant part of control. You've got these, these guys are controlling the regiments to make sure they go in the right direction at the right time. And you have your Lieutenant Colonel over here on your uh, right flank. I, I drew this when I was in my twenties. I, I took Casey's tactics and just 
uh, I don't, I, it took me a week to figure it out, but I'm glad I finally got to use this. Okay, so from the regiment, we've got brigade commanders killed or, or mortally wounded during the battle. Uh, you've got Elisha Frank, Frank, yeah, Frank Paxton. He had led the Stonewall Brigade. Then you've got Colonel Garnett. He's mortally wounded. You've got Walker and then Edwards. Stonewall Brigade. We want to look at this more closely. Now, I, I did not know much about uh, Paxton before this, um, but Stonewall Jackson recommended Paxton. And if you know anything about Stone, uh, Thomas Jackson, uh, he's type A. He's very picky. And for Jackson to pick Paxton to, to lead the Stonewall Brigade, that, that was saying a lot. And Paxton was a great organizer from what I can tell. We don't know how great he would have been because we only have him in Fred, the Battle of Fredericksburg and then Chancellorsville where he's killed on May 3rd. So that is a huge loss. And then with the Stonewall Brigade as a whole, you've got 54 killed, 430 wounded, nine missing, 493 total. I think Douglas Freeman said it best. He noted that the Stonewall Brigade never was itself in full might after that battle. And if you look at, uh, recall where the Stonewall Brigade was at Gettysburg, yes, they were at Culp's Hill and that was a, a very rough terrain again, but um, they, they did not, they did not get to do much um, at, and, and that had to have been partly because of the, the lack of good commanders. So with the division and brigade commanders who are wounded, and I found this interesting quote by Lee, which I thought was interesting because he's, he has these aggressive tactics that he, he has to use but then he writes to Hood in May 21, he said, proper commanders, where can they be obtained? Well, he's got, he, he, his list is, is getting shorter and shorter. Why? Well, from Chancellorsville, we have slightly wounded uh, Hill. Hill was uh, wounded at the same time Jackson was in the, in the salvo. And then you have Henry Heath, also slightly wounded. They, they both are, uh, make it to Gettysburg. Uh, Dorsey Pender, he's slightly wounded. He makes it to Gettysburg. You have Ramsier, wounded, present at Gettysburg. The general's not at um, Gettysburg. Nichols, he's severely wounded. That was a significant brigade, and I never really looked at this until now, but Nichols commands five Louisiana regiments. And if you haven't read it, or you have read it, I, I suggest reading it again, Lee's Tigers, a great book on the Louisiana troops. Uh, they're a tough group to uh, command. And the Colonel, uh, Colonel Williams takes over command of the brigade. And Lee was, he was hesitant, but he wanted to get to Gettysburg. So he let Williams uh, command, command the, the brigade. Um, again, you have to have tough leadership for the right personality of the brigade. Uh, Robido Wheat, he would have been great, but Lee had lost him. Uh, back in the seven seven days uh, battle battles, um, for uh, you've got also Samuel McGowan. McGowan, he's severely wounded, and he doesn't get back into the field until sixty four. Then you have Robert Hoke; he's severely wounded as well, and he doesn't get back into the field until fall of eighteen sixty three. You have Colonel uh, Williams; he's wounded. I didn't find him at Gettysburg. Um, possibly uh, if somebody else may have um, again. And then you've got uh, Lieutenant Colonel Thurston. He was a brigade commander at Chancellorsville. 
who's wounded and he's not present at Gettysburg. So that's nine. Five of those guys don't make it to Gettysburg. That's a big bill. All right. Now we're all maybe been waiting for this guy. Yes, this is a big loss. The problem is historians focus on this one casualty. And they look to the quote of Lee who says, Lee, Lee has lost his left arm, but I have lost my right arm. I've talked to several senior commanders and they all uh, admit that they are expendable. That does not mean that they are not good commanders, that they did not make an impact. But this is one person. And from a civilian perspective, if, if anybody's ever coached uh, or heard the term, you need to play the bench, you need to have more guys on the team that you can put in, um, that's really where we're working with here. Um, Jackson and Lee did have an incredible relationship, an incredible trust that they had built up. But Lee had somebody that he could have replaced Jackson with very quickly and I believe easily. Uh, who is that person? Jeb Stewart. Okay, Jeb Stewart. We all know his his cavalry expedition, his his rides around around the Army of the Potomac, but Jeb took over at the height of the chaos. Jackson had gone down. Hill went down. Everybody's on the attack for the Confederates. You don't know where anybody is. That's one of the problems with an attack. But at any rate, Jeb steps in and he keeps the attack going. He then continues to, to command the, uh, the Confederate left, left wing on May 3rd. So he definitely proven as a cavalryman, he could command uh, infantry. That, that was no problem. We know he worked well with, with Lee. And like Jackson, Jeb did not need a lot of guidance. Most importantly, Jeb knows, he, he translates Lee's if practicable, which is a very wordy word, but it's um, a, a very common 19th century word. So Stuart understands if practicable for Lee means do it. This doesn't happen. Stuart does not get the job. So that's where we are. Um, we can discuss uh, during the questions theories on why. So let's look at um, measuring the cost. Let's 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 review review this. If Jackson had escaped being wounded at Chancellorsville, it still would have been a Pyrrhic victory. Why? We can look at it this way. Uh, I, I use uh, James Bartholomew's uh, theory of victory scales. And even though the generals back then did not have this handy dandy, cool looking victory uh, scales, Grant did this. He looked at the scale of success, scale of decisiveness, scale of achievement. This is what Lee needed to do. So scale of success for, for Lee at Chancellorsville. Well, it's a definite win. Uh, I mean, we're not. It, he he gets he gets the uh, the crossroads, and he does kill and and wound a lot of Union soldiers. Not enough to incapacitate them because that's impossible unless you have the power of Holy Spirit. If you believe that, um, only then can you kill that many uh, soldiers. So let's look at the scale of decisiveness. This is where it starts getting uh, not, not good for Lee. It's potential deterioration. It's on the high side of potential deterioration to the low side of significant deterior deterioration. 
So that that's kind of where the, then you're going to the scale of achievement. I'm going to put that at slight because his success, his achievements are temporary. So you have to put it at either slight or limited. So that's really as a whole, um, you have to look at, at, at this battle and in a, in a kind of a big picture. Um, and, and lastly, I, I'm, uh, I was mentored to look at lessons learned. Um, how, uh, how do we apply historical lessons to today? And I call this the, you know, the challenge question around the kitchen table question. You know, is the United States re repeating this pattern of winning pure victories? And I'm not saying that uh, we're losing too many men, although um, at, after years and years of chipping, of, of losing here, you know, five there, 10 there, it does add up. But you also have to look at economic cost. What's the economic cost? I mean, countries will die financially. So um, for our, um, my uh, Korean War veteran friends, I have the picture here of the Korea War. And then my, my case under in front, I have case on, and we've got Iraq. Yes, for those, Bill Jane was at case on. Yep. And then we've got Iraq, and then we've got the 101st in uh, Afghanistan. So that's kind of your challenge question. And I'm going to open up the uh, floor or the uh, platform to questions. Okay, I've unmuted myself and uh, I, let's see on the chat, um, I don't see any questions on the chat. So uh, let me uh, try to get a question. Go ahead, do you wanna stop um, sharing your screen? Yeah. How do you wanna work it? I got, I got questions. Okay. Go ahead. I got three. Uh, I don't work it. I'm gonna go. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. Um, question. Who? Uh, uh, I got a question. Uh, that, who's that trench? Uh, where's that trench? Is that in uh, Chancellorsville? That would have been part of the Fredericksburg uh, battlefield that was uh, part of the Chancellorsville battle. And that's the photograph of the uh, dead Confederates there. Here's a challenge, another challenge for students of uh, photography. There aren't a lot of uh, photographs from Chancellorsville, but yeah. it was also a moving campaign. So well, yeah. how, long, how long would it take them to dig that uh, trench and when would we, when would we be digging it? Would, would we oh, that, dig that, was, that was Mary's Heights. So Fredericksburg, there was two parts to Chancellorsville battle. You've got the battle uh, in the wilderness area mm -hmm. and then you have the battle near Fredericksburg. Mm -hmm. And the battle near Fredericksburg, that's the photograph is taken of Mary's Heights. So that that was that trench or was it like that was like a sunken road, uh, your culvert uh, where the soldiers used used that for the first first Fredericksburg and second Fredericksburg. Um, I've heard it said that the, the, some felt it was uh, better to wound. Uh, it took uh, three people to two people to carry the body out of the uh, the, the wounded. Uh, comrade off the field so some commanders felt that it was better to wound and then you get three people off the field uh, uh, never heard that yeah i i have i'm not sure it, i've never heard lee say that um 
<clears throat> but it definitely uh, the, the, you would have what they called the Good Samaritans trying to take yeah. their buddies off the field, which depletes your regiment. Yeah, uh, and I had another question uh, the Bartholomew theory of victory. Who had these uh, re to review? Were they given to the commander in the, in the field or were they, were they something that they were... Uh, no, the, study they, written, study this, this wasn't... This is from Barthol Bartholomew's theory of victory scales is from a contemporary article. Sorry about yeah. that. I didn't, it's from a contemporary article. However, my point is that every army commander, uh, corps commander, uh, you know, every regimental commander, he had to look at scale of success. You had to look at the scale of decisiveness, and you have to look at the scale of achievement. So yes. I'm I'm using a modern tool to look at an old concept, but mm -hmm. again, Grant Grant looked at the scale of success. He looked at the scale of decisiveness and he looked at the scale of achievement. Um, we know that for sure. Well, when did Grant get them? Uh, I mean, uh, hey, he didn't have these scales. He, but he looked at the concept, the concept of scale of success. He looked at the uh, Grant looked at this the concept. He didn't right. physically have this um, table. Uh, Joanna, if you were to look at this from the union point of view, where would you place these circles? Uh, uh, well, that would be a scale of success, not win. <laughs> uh, I would put uh, status quo and I would put scale of achievement, none. Negligible. I mean, I, you know, Hooker doesn't do well either. So, so did the Union lose a significant portion of their officers and experienced people as the Confederates did? I, I didn't look at that uh, specifically. Um, if they did, they had a, a um, they had more depth to choose from. And I'm using, again, hindsight, but if you look at how the Army of the Potomac performs at Gettysburg and the leadership there, and it's not just Chamberlain, you've got a lot of regimental commanders who really step up. And um, you've got uh, the six <coughs> Wisconsin. Um, you know, I, I, I have my Gettysburg book here, but at any rate, um, I'm guessing they did lose uh, quite a few uh, officers, but again, the, the officers who replaced them stepped up to the plate and, and were, were competent, very well competent, to, to take on the challenge of Gettysburg. Uh, there are many, many with that. Uh, let, let's go on, uh, Jim, let me... Let me, uh, a couple of other people have posed questions, uh, so let me give them a chance to, okay? Yeah. All right, Jim, Jim Gannon, you raised your hand, and uh, I see a couple of uh, questions on the chat line, too, and I think, uh, yeah, you have to look at this in terms of what uh, Lee wanted to achieve, too, which was different than Hooker, but uh, Jim mm -hmm. Gannon, go ahead and pose your question. Joanna, I, I was just wondering, do you want to say a little more about how Lee felt about the battle? I mean, was he feeling like, uh, hey, this was a big accomplishment, we're about to win the war? Or did, was he feeling the impact of uh, losing so many of the officer corps? Good question. And I, I found a quote from Lee. Um, I didn't mention it, but here up, up top, what Lee says about the battle uh, to, it, now, he writes this to his, all his men. Uh, he sends this uh, message out. We will, while we mourn their loss, the, their casualties, let us resolve to emulate their noble example. Okay, so that's, um, he does feel that he has made a great achievement. 
And uh, but the I ironic thing is, he also is saying to Hood on uh, May 21st, I need good officers. If I had good officers and I could organize my army well, I'd, I'd, I'd be in, in this, you know, in, indestructible. It's like, well, you can't have both. Tim, Tim Winstead uh, asked on the chat line, uh, was Ewell Lee's best choice for uh, taking command of the Second Corps? <laughs> no. And <laughs> uh, I, I will. Uh, oh, what was that I, 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 I would, was Yule the best choice for the Second Corps? And my, aunt, my short answer was no. Um, but here's the problem. Uh, one, Yule's not a bad commander, and we see that after Gettysburg. But when you are taking an army into a, an unknown situation like the, uh, his Summer of 63 offensive, you need a commander who knows... Uh, who's been there um, without any breaks. Um, Yule's had too much downtime. Um, he needs some time to build up his confidence. Um, but Lee gets him, corners himself politically, in fact. And, um, and Yule's wife, of course, is uh, politically savvy and befriends Je uh, Tom... Uh, Jefferson Davis, and uh, Lee wants Davis's blessing, and Davis is convinced that Yule can go ahead and take take the Second Corps, and and so history's written. Okay, um, was that Lee's choice? Is that what you said? Was Lee was Lee's choice? No, that was not Lee's. I, I it was Davis's choice. Well, Lee didn't want. Uh, I don't. Well, we're not too sure. I mean, the way Lee never, Lee never badmouthed his his his, yeah, his, yeah. his the president, and he would not have been that uh, yeah, yeah. blunt. Okay, let me let me get on to a couple of other questions. Uh, hmm. Byron, Byron Hovey says, um, "Okay, we're at the same question we always face uh, of battles during the Civil War." Uh, did the commanders get too used to high casualties, too accepting of them? And why was that? Good question. Well, yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, I think for Lee, and I, um, I talk about this when I talk about, uh, in the book, I talk about, I have an entire chapter on Lee's grand tactics. And his, Entire goal was a, he thought he could win that war through a decisive victory. He was on a quest for a decisive victory. And I, he accepted those large casualties with the hope that he could inflict higher casualties on the North, on the Army of Northern, uh, uh, excuse me, on the Army of Potomac to cause the Army of Potomac to collapse. Uh, it's a it's a false theory, uh, but hey, yeah, it's 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 an interesting mindset. Um, and nowhere else. Um, it'd be interesting to compare uh, casualties. I'm not from, I'm not as familiar with the Napoleonic uh, Wars, but um, what the casualties were like for for those battles and whether. You know, it would just happen to be Napoleonic tactics that that era was, okay, we, we're going to suffer high casualties. Um, but yeah, nowhere else in, in at least American military history do, do we take that high casualties. That's a good question. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, go to Mark Swanstrom next, but uh, George Holston uh, on the chat uh, to everyone said uh, he looked it up apparently. Uh, Union losses at Chancellorsville were uh, about 17,000. Um, the Army of Northern Virginia lost plus or minus 20%. Union losses percentage-wise were less, 15%. Mm. So okay, good. That's, that's interesting. Mark, Thank you. 
Mark, go ahead and uh, pose your question. Yeah. Hey, uh, if Jackson could have picked one of his subordinate generals to take his place after he's wounded, who do you think that would be? And I've got a name in mind. I have to. <laughs> um, I I have read and heard that it was Yule. Um, I'm but... thinking Rhodes. Ro Rhodes. Hmm. Uh. I don't, I don't know enough about Rhodes. I, I do know what Rhodes did in Gettysburg, but um, yeah, that's a toughie. Um, okay. But it, 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 here's the thing that we should step back and think about. This should have been discussed by Lee and Jackson and Longstreet. Why wasn't it? Why didn't anybody write this down? Why weren't they having this conversation? Look, they're on the field of battle constantly at Antietam. They're all on horses trying to get the guys in the right place. Bullets are flying. Why didn't some, they sit down and go, um, if I'm shot and taken out, who might, who, who should replace me? Or this is who I think should replace me. This should have been discussed. I don't think it was because it's, it's, we don't have it. And, Taylor is a great uh, biographer. He's one of uh, Lee's staff officers, and he would have written it down. Um, and, uh, you know, one of uh, the other Armistead, uh, yeah, Armistead, he would, he would have written it down. Um, but this is something that every good command does. It, it does sound morbid, but you have to have a plan in place. I think succession of command is a relatively new term historically. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, all, all these guys kind of came along pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. So uh, still a lot of, I'm a retired Marine colonel, so, okay. so I got, uh, I've been through the schools on this stuff. So, uh, but right. I'd heard some comments about Rhodes as a, in fact, he's one of the more senior guys right there at the uh, flank attack, the infantry officer. So just, just wondered about it. I had a pretty good reputation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Tim, uh, Tim Winstead has another question. That, um, was D.H. Hill ever considered? Tim says uh, Hill, D.H. Hill, did not, mm -hmm. did not seem to attract wounds like Pender and others. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Gordon. He, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, well, most importantly, I think DH was pretty capable. He had, had commanded large, <laughs> large uh, amount of men. Um, now he had been out of the the main fighting for a while. He he was down in the North Carolina area, but uh, um, I don't I, I don't know if we mentions his his name. I, I I'm, I'm guessing his name did come up. Um, but it's, uh, huh. somebody needs to do a paper on how Yule's wife, uh, <laughs> Mrs. Brown, Mrs. Brown, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I'm sorry. So there are stereotypes and she makes the stereotype of a military officer wife. Um, but how she, she may have helped win the, the war for the union, ironically, um, but yeah, she really pushed to get her hubby uh, in that that spot. And 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 like I say, and um, I I go along with what Dick Summers uh, has always said. Um, and Dick, being um, very knowledgeable in the Petersburg campaign, Yule does a fantastic job. The point about putting a new guy, whether it's Yule or somebody else, but somebody who has not been on the field of battle. Um, <laughs> And has been, and, and prior to that, had commanded a division. <coughs> he had commanded a division. And then you're going to put him in a new spot, a new, uh, uh, at a core level. You're going to put him in a, a unique situation on, on the offensive and tell him you better perform to your A plus, 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 plus level. That's not going to happen, um, and it didn't. So, um, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Joanna. Did you have? 
Well, I was just going to say, but that whole conversation about you always should go back to who, and we all know the responsibility stops with the commander in chief of the mm -hmm. army, Lee. Let, let me pose a question, and I'm going to uh, pose it in the context of a couple more comments and uh, facts from uh, Matt and George Holston. Uh, Matt says uh, union losses were higher but were similar in killed and wounded. Hmm. Union missing included 5,000 captured, thus killed and wounded were similar. Mm -hmm. and, uh, George says uh, both Union and Confederate officers would have studied battles by Napoleon. Uh, Wellington's casualties, I guess at uh, Waterloo, were around 15,000. Uh, Blucher's at about 8,000. Uh, Napoleon suffered roughly 25,000 casualties. Well, 9,000 Frenchmen were captured. Uh, he says, too bad the World War I generals uh, yeah. didn't seem to draw any lessons. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, the big question is that uh, um, the, the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac were, were much different organizations. The Army of the Potomac was much bigger. It was much better supplied. Uh, the point was that it, Lee, it seemed to me that uh, his greatest asset was the, uh, the leadership ability of his uh, officers and the uh, fighting ability of his, his soldiers. And he was uh, losing the best ones time after time. Like that was the thing about Johnson's Island. And, you mm -hmm. know, there already were 3,000 uh, Confederate uh, officers that they could ill afford to lose. Uh, being held in a prison camp. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and don't forget with the, with the casualty rates of, of this time frame, um, these, the Napoleonic tactics are now combined with these rifles. But the whole object was to shoot, to have one salvo, and then bayonet, have a bayonet charge. What they did during the Civil War is their... They're having a slugfest. I mean, the Iron Brigade at Gettysburg is out there for at least an hour and a half plus, slugging it out with the Confederates. Uh, I, I can't. I, I. I don't know how you. I how that they did it, but they did. Um, so that's where you're going to get higher building, building a higher casualties rather than um, if they had put a salvo into your opponent and then bayonet charge and then you break the line. That, that was the theory, but they're not doing this during the Civil War. Uh, some people say it's because of the, the, the volunteer soldiers, um, which could have been. Joanna, what do you think of uh, Lee's, uh, I think you called it a grand tactics, uh, the, the mm. idea of trying to get the uh, the one uh, uh, decisive battle that would uh, um, bring the British into the war, or at least get the British to, uh, or French to recognize the Confederacy. Uh, was that what drove him even after these losses at Chancellorsville to invade the North again? Um, yeah, I'm getting to where, here, the example, air over vistage, yeah. Um, uh, th it was a huge problem and and the way you look at this is what Lee is really trying to do take take everything back peel everything back he's trying to outkill his opponent now how are you going to outkill an army the army of Potomac that's got mm, give or take 60 plus thousand guys on the field like I said you'd have to have the Holy Spirit power in every single one of your guys to kill at least 10 plus of the, the enemy, the, the Army of Potomac. You, you can't outkill your, your uh, enemy in this type of war. Um, where else, Bill, did we try to outkill our opponent? <laughs> Bill Jane. <laughs> yeah, well. Body counts. Where we had no other uh, idea <laughs> of strategy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, hello. Yeah, see, this is how it's all connected. It's like, it, it, and 
that's one thing I, I, I tell people. I, for all of these failures, I, I'm glad because the, the, the lessons are here if we, we take a step back and, and, and not get emotional per se and say, well, you're just being me. No, we want to learn. Uh, trying to outkill your, your opponent doesn't work. Plain and simple. Um, and um, his quest for a decisive victory is exactly that. Uh, you just, it, it, it's, a, it's a nice term, um, but he's really just trying to outkill his opponent. And, and you can't do that at a tactical level. You have to get the Northern civilians to really hurt. And the Northern civilians, besides losing relatives, they never physically felt the pain that the South did. Um, and that's, that's where, where one of the big gaps is for, for Lee. What, what kind of uh, alternatives did uh, Lee have other than uh, another invasion of the North after Chancellorsville? Well, you've got to consider what's going on in Vicksburg. Uh, Vicksburg is a huge, huge strategic uh, uh, point that they, they needed to be looking at. Um, I think putting a, um, an alternative is setting up um, a good, strong defense, but also sending Jeb Stewart with like a... a, a the light division into uh, Ohio or northern parts of, of uh, West Virginia or or South Central, where I grew up, Chambersburg, Carlisle area, and uh, burn it, burn it, and take as much food as possible and get in, get out. Um, I'm not advocating killing or murdering civilians. Not saying that, but you um, make sure the civilians know that they're, they're part of this war. Meanwhile, see if you can help out with the Vicksburg situation. Um, but to go from huge casualties at Chancellorsville to another huge casualties at Gettysburg, and then you see another huge casualties at, at, at the wilderness. Lee has... Um, I kind of liken Lee to a, uh, well, back then he would have been a racehorse. He's got one speed, aggressive, aggressive tactics. Uh, nowadays he'd be like a, a, a Porsche. <laughs> you know, he's, he's boom. Um, and and that's, that's who Lee was, but, um, and he never seemed to, he didn't ever want to uh, shift that gear. And, and try to do what uh, they call the Fabian strategy of hit, hit and run, like Washington did in, um, in uh, the revolution. Um, Matt notes, uh, Lee was furious over the fact that Hooker escaped over the river when he was surrounded or, or hemmed in. Mm -hmm. he turned to Sumner, who also was pinned against the river in Fredericksburg, but Lee's attack was not coordinated and Sumner escapes across the river. Uh, Lee yes. lost two chances to destroy a large portion of the Army of the Potomac. Do you think, uh, you, you were just talking about his personality and uh, you talked earlier in the, uh, the presentation about, uh, you know, the importance of the commander not losing his cool, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm. potentially part of the, uh, issue here? Uh, yes. Again, that goes back to um, Lee is a perfectionist um, and, and combined with his, his um, conviction that he and his men can kill, incapacitate the Army of Potomac. He's always frustrated that his men let the uh, Army of Potomac uh, escape. And I've got this quote. I don't know if you guys can see this, this screen, but he said to General Pender, and I think this goes back to why Stuart doesn't get tapped for the, the second corps position. I think Lee in the back of his head kind of blames Stuart for letting the Army of Potomac escape. Not fair. 
but that that's that's Lee. But Lee said he he's very snippy to to Pender, and he says, "Why Pender? That is what you young men always do. You allow these people to get away. I tell you what to do, but you don't do it." I think that really hurt Pender. I think I, I'm most likely Stewart, Jeb Stewart heard, heard this. I mean, these guys were working their butts off. And I don't know if anybody's ever worked for somebody who's a perfectionist and a type A. It, it's hard to please. I mean, that you, you're not going to and you have to accept that you're not going to please them. But um, yeah, uh, Lee snaps. And um, I, I always thought it was uh, kind of a side note that... Um, it's interesting that for all of, you know, Lee losing his hem temper here, he's still, he, he does not swear. The, the worst he calls the, the uh, union uh, commanders or the union side is these people, those people. Um, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you allow these people to get away. Um, no, they didn't. I mean, you also have, um, I like what um, the contemporary general, retired general Jack Keane always says. And I, I know Marine generals say this too. Your, your enemy gets a vote. The Army of the Potomac wasn't just going, oh, here they come. No, they were running the other way really fast. And obviously they outran them. Um, <laughs> that was the name of that game in that situation. Um, so um, I do talk about that in... Um, the, uh, my chapter on Lee's uh, command and control, he didn't like to um, co confront how his senior officers, however, he would lose his temper with his, his uh, more junior generals and, and, and some of the staff officers. And I, th this really hurt him. I, I really do think so. Um, and these aren't sensitive guys. They're not, they're not snowflakes. Um, but again, you think about it, you're Pender, you're Jeb Stewart, you, you just got done two days of incredible fighting, you're dirty, you're sweaty, you're smelly, and, and they look up to Lee, he's an incredible uh, figure, he's like their dad, and, and he says, this is what you young men always do, you allow these people to get away. Um, I think that's one reason why Stewart tries so hard to, to get at the Yankees at, at Brandy Station, and then he goes all out at Gettysburg. Um, and Pender, too. Pender, Pender goes all out at Gettysburg. Um, most, most humans, most subordinate officers, and, and more civilians, they want to please their commanders. They want to please their managers. So if anybody is still working and in a command position, it, the, it, most people do want to please their commanders. Um, so that, well, that's a good question. Th this is a really interesting discussion and, and thanks for sticking with us. And uh, I want to end it on a, a couple of notes. Uh, one more comment from uh, Byron. Um, this is a, another interesting uh, insight at Gettysburg. The regiment facing the Iron Brigade, the 26th North Carolina, mm -hmm. lost most of its men. Uh, with the losses at the Wilderness Campaign and onward, the Federals lost numbers of troops almost equal to the entire Confederate Army. War by attrition, looking forward to the attack tactics uh, of the First World War, uh, wasn't sustainable for the South. And... Uh, I think um, with that, I think that is a good um, final word. And uh, I want to remind everybody that uh, we've got Brad Godfrey on uh, March 11th. And uh, one other thing I'm going to try to show. We have a very interesting sort of uh, gift for Joanna. And since she's a member of our uh, roundtable and she's local, we haven't uh, obviously paid any kind of... Uh, travel expenses or anything, but uh, thanks to uh, Matt Farina, we have um, three, uh, the, my camera is not picking them up there, um, caches, the um, postal covers that 
are dated. They were canceled oh. at um, Thank Chancellorsville you. for uh, in 1998, Matt, was that the 100 uh, yeah, the 135th anniversary of Chancellorsville. And uh, oh, wow, neat. Very nice. And uh, thank you. We'll figure out a good way to get them to you, Joanna. Thank you very much for the carrier uh, pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> sure, thank honey. you. Okay, with that, uh, Jim Horton says, Good job. I echo that. Thanks very much. Uh, good meeting. And uh, Ed, uh, with that, we can, yep, close it down, I suppose. Good night, everybody. Good night. Night. Thank you. Good night.